Mary Midgley is a philosopher who really needs no introduction. Her work and her wit inspire readers both inside and outside the Academy. In this RIP broadcast, she talks to Michael Babbage about her time at Oxford and the importance of a holistic approach to philosophy. Recently, people have begun to get interested in a group of women philosophers who were in Oxford, and you were one of them. Um, they were interested in them individually before. Yourself, of course, and Iris Murdoch, uh, Philip Foot, so on. But they now begin to think of them as a group. Yeah. Uh, did you feel that you were a group at the time? Um, we were all friends, and we tended to spend a lot of time together thinking about what's wrong with philosophy in Oxford, uh, because we thought something was, um, but we were... Um, uh, we were not, as it were, uh, hiring premises, you know, we, we didn't feel that a, a, a group <laughs> in a more general way. Um, but we did tend to do that, and I can particularly remember us all being in Philippa Foote's front room and saying, we shall have to do something about this. It was in the sort of way that people do, you know, not particularly expecting that they'll be able to, uh, but we were uh, of one mind that there was something wrong with the way in which philosophy was being conducted in Oxford then. Can you remember what specifically you were unhappy about, about the way philosophy was being well, approached? It was decidedly supposed to be being about words and small questions about words, small questions about the ambiguity of particular term, terms um, seem to obsess our teachers. Not everybody, by the way. We were very lucky that we did have some teachers who were not in this line. Um, Donald McKinnon was tutor to three of us and he was as far as you can get from this sort of thing. Um, but I remember a time that particularly depressed me. I'd been to a meeting, a philosophical meeting, somebody had you know, read a paper and then people had discussed it. The paper that they read was about a very small verbal point raised by some of Austin's writings. But the discussion wasn't about that. It was about much smaller points, which had arisen to raise much smaller ambiguities. Um, and I sat in a seat on the high on my way home and thought, oh dear, does this happen? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I take it it's a very common situation for uh, some students to be... Uh, feeling a bit rebellious in this sort of way. Mm -hmm. I don't think that every time it happens they find themselves uh, called a group later in life. But it was about time that something was done, you see. Yes. So I think we were, uh, as a way, quite lucky. Yes. It, it strikes me that those individuals who made up that group were quite even then, in early days, very individual. Oh, yes. Um, but still I'll ask the question, did, did you have philosophical heroes, did you have philosophical villains? Were there people who you really didn't like? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean personally, I mean no, of course not. But We disapproved of Austin. Yes. We knew he was very clever and was raising big questions, but he, um, he always honed in on these small questions. Now one quite interesting thing about this is when I was a graduate student, he was running a very famous class on Saturday mornings, and it was a great sort of honour to be asked to go on this, because it was supposed to be very highbrow, and what they were doing was investigating certain ambiguities. You see, the meaning of some words, you thought you knew what this word meant, but actually you didn't. Now, um, I was lucky enough to get out of Oxford before I ever got asked to do this. Philippa did do it for a bit, and I think she would have been up to better at it than I would ever have been. I, my, I mean, one reason I wouldn't like this was I know, like, I'm really stupid, I don't see this, you know, uh, uh, but I, um, it wasn't only that. I, 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 
increasingly from that time on. I thought they were wasting their time. Because there are much bigger questions, that's the point. There's a much a larger world which they were not looking at. Yes. You, you eventually, uh, I'm not sure I say eventually because I don't know the date, you married Geoffrey Midgley. Yeah, that's now, 1950. 1950. Yes. Um, I had the privilege of knowing Jeff very well eventually, but much later. Um, he was extraordinarily dynamic and energetic philosopher. Uh, you couldn't live a philosophically quiet life when he was there. I wonder, how much do you think that he influenced you? Well, I think we influenced each other. I mean, we picked up in the first place by starting some conversation in the middle of the morning and going off to my room with someone else and eating mince pork pie. Um, and we remained there until six o'clock. We liked just like talking. Um, and that continued. Um, Yes, I mean, we were part of what I think was a rather interesting group of graduate students just after the war people who had been doing all sorts of other things. You see, these tended to be grown-ups. Yes. They were not going straight on from school. They do it and know all sorts of things, Strauss and Warnock and quite a lot of them. Um, Peter Geach, uh, Elizabeth Lanskin. Um, so I think that good, good conversation was going on on the, uh, both at the classes that we went to and in between times. Um, and certainly, I mean, Jeff never stopped talking philosophy, not to the day of his death. Yes. Um, what he preferred to do, his pet, pet occupation, was to go and sit in the junior common room with the students and talk with them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that you wouldn't be allowed to do these days you know, if you're uh, paid to be a philosophy lecturer, you're supposed to do it nine tenths of the time or something. Uh, in any way, you're certainly not, mm -hmm. it's certainly not thought to be doing your job. Yes. But those students, of course, come back from time to time and say, what a splendid thing it was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I come across people from time to time who occupy themselves in the same way, but they're usually, of course, not being paid to do that. Um, and I don't know how, I mean, obviously that's what happened in Athens, isn't it? That uh, people would sit down in the gymnasium and down there, bouncing, yes. and, 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 and ask each other all questions, and this would go on. Even uh, then, going back quite some time, uh, you were publishing, you, you had articles published, didn't you? Not philosophical. Uh, well, I was very willing to write um, about anything that anybody would ask me to, unless there was something wrong with it. Um, quite soon after losing college, I was asked to do talks on the third programme. The, the third programme was a <laughs> uh, an extra one, the others being home service and Light program. Light program, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, the third program was meant to be a little bit more um, intellectual, um, but not unbearably dull, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, at that time, I think it must have come up straight after the war, probably, um, or towards the end of the war. Uh, it was very intelligent, it was very well done. And there was a, a producer there called Anna Cullen, who very much took to my stuff and pretended to publish everything I could save her. Um, anyway, we worked together and she would suggest things. Um, the only exception about this, the only time she turned down something that I suggested was when I had written an article about the interesting fact that nearly all really famous philosophers were bachelors. They didn't, didn't have to contend with family life. Now, this now seems a perfectly respectable and normal thing to say. She thought it was disgusting because you must not interfere, let domestic life interfere with the um, uh, serious uh, yeah. philosophical topics yes. that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
um, quite lately some women who are studying my work at Durham uh, picked up this and said, gosh, this is interesting. It's called Rings and Books, you see, for obvious reasons. Um, and that, that these days, uh, it's just a bit of a rather intelligent feminism, uh, because then, as you know, it seems to be, if you think about it, that this fact that he never had to contend with a uh, kind, uh, particularly kind, uh, mm -hmm. with a family life, with, <laughs> with, the, with having her people near to him, uh, opposing him and making difficulties, that this really makes a difference. And Aristotle's one of the very few who did, you see, and I yeah. think he basically improved his, improved his work. I mean, some philosophers like uh, Berkeley and G. E. Moore got married after they finished philosophizing. So, I mean, they weren't, it wasn't being a nuisance in the family or um, uh, that. Family wasn't being a nuisance to it, um, but but I mean, if you think back to the monastic tradition, you see in the, yeah. the way in which people like Aquinas lived, it sort of made a difference. And Plato, I am a bit puzzled about Plato because every upper class Greek does did get married in general, but you never hear that Plato was married. Yeah, I asked you about them because <clears throat> I've read some of the talks that you gave. And they're witty, and they're elegantly written yeah. in uh, 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 an easily understood style. Yeah. And I think that even your severest critic would say that you are a beautiful writer of philosophical prose, and that uh, this is why you have a wide readership and people get a satisfaction out of reading you. Um, do, do you think that uh, that early experience of writing under the discipline of, of uh, broadcasting and so on encouraged that, that kind of communicative power? Well, well, yes. I mean, if I'm going to write something, I see no point in doing it if nobody's going to be able to read it. Yes. And as I am writing, I am constantly thinking, well, what somebody heard from that? You know, um, and I, uh, if it, what often happens is I uh, then go off for lunch and, uh, and something occurs to me, so I come back and put it in. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't seem to me there's anything virtuous about writing dully. You know, uh, no. some people can't help it, but, but, but uh, that you should somehow say the thing in a way that, be make, uh, that gets it across to people yeah. seems to me. Part, part of the point, um, and I mean, I suppose, in a way, Philippa thought I was wasting my time because I was talking about a lot of other subjects. Yes. But I think I was often doing philosophy about yeah. them. Uh -huh. uh, it, never, it was never a separate, separate topic yeah. to me. Okay. The nonetheless, the. It was some time before your, you found your philosophical voice, uh, at least in a public way. And I think it was, was it 1978 or some date like that, when you published Beast and Man. Yes. C tell us about how that came about, that well, book. Well, that was really quite interesting. I had put an article in the periodical philosophy uh, called The Concept of Beastliness. Max Black who I suppose was editing or knew the editors, liked this um, and said, I want this woman to come to Cornell. So he invited me to Cornell and he arranged a whole program of different talks with anthropologists and physicists and mathematicians and literary critics and God knows who. Um, because then my, what I was writing touched on all these things. I mean, this was very hard work. Um, but then the Cornell Press said, uh, do us a book, so I did them a book. Um, by that time I was feeling that it was sort of coming together, you see, that I had some idea of what ought to be central to this book. Um, and what I was trying to make central to it was that the idea of rationality, that if we say what people are rational, we're not just saying they get their 
logic right, we're saying that they've got a good um, hierarchy of ideas, they've got a, a pattern mm -hmm. which works out as a whole. <laughs> and I sent that into the Cornell Press, they sent it back saying, now put in the sociobiology, which was the fashion of the day, you see. Yes. Uh, this was a sort of pre dawkins dawkins uh, the same sort of um, reductive stuff. So I bought this enormous book and uh, fitted it in, which was again very hard work. Um, but I think that, I mean, obviously this sold the thing because that was what everybody wanted to talk about. I, by this time I was really pretty deeply involved, you see, in a great range of subjects. I had been aiming very hard to get the relevance of different subjects to each other, clear, to bring things together which were being considered separately. Um, and everything I've written since probably takes off in some direction from that pattern mm -hmm. which I was put, trying to put together in, in Beast and Man. And in this way I was doing a thing similar to what the other ladies whom I'm now being linked were doing. Iris Murdoch was very keen on doing just that, bringing things together and making a sort of ethics that was talked realistic, making me about the world. Um, and so was Elizabeth Anscombe, who was particularly furious with the uh, rather superficial sort of ethics that was going on at the time. I, I must get it again. She wrote an article called Modern Moral Philosophy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, using I, it was generally a little bit more polite, but she was not polite. She spoke no. very strongly about what was happening then, and quite quietly. And Philippa um, was doing this in different ways. So I mean, we, we were all uh, working together on the, what one can describe it on, the, on so easily on the negative side. You see, what didn't work going on. Yeah. Um, but if you do that, it, you've got to be having something in common, more positively, yeah. and I think we do. You said that the women philosophers with um, whom you were contemporary, uh, even though you might have developed your philosophies, your positive philosophical thoughts in different directions, you agreed on a negative, the negative aspect of it. Um, and I just wonder, can we characterise that? And particularly in relation to moral philosophy. So there was a way of doing philosophy, I imagine, if I'm right, R.M. Hare might be a, a, an outstanding example of it, that you didn't like very much. And not just because of the style or something, no, no. but because of the content. It was reductive, it mm. was over-abstract, it was aiming to simplify the moral life to a formula. Mm -hmm. um, and... I mean, this was true of a lot of philosophy, I think, that people thought they'd got there. Once they'd got to something that looked pretty much like a set of equations, mm -hmm. the, the modelling on mathematics, uh, which picked up with Descartes, I mean, this was a, quite a widespread thought, who said uh, we need to find that there needs to be a, a Newton of psychology. Yeah. Well, this is treating psychology like physics, but it isn't physics. Mm -hmm. You see, I commented on this in Beast and Man. I said, it doesn't come from psychology, it doesn't and didn't need a Newton. What it needs is a Darwin. Yeah. And someone who will study all the details and I'll explain why the bits are put together, you see. Um, this. Um, uh, to get more and more abstract, yes. um, I think was very deadly to ethics, and I, did, I think what we were all saying in common is really quite an obvious large thing, yes. that you can't do ethics like mathematics, it yes. isn't like mathematics, it isn't like physics. Yeah. Um, it's a matter of understanding um, what's happening when people make uh, moral judgments or moral campaigns. Um, 
understanding it in relation to the rest of their lives, seeing what what, what it's coming from, what it's meant to be achieving. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think the, uh, the I might say the worship of physics has increased since then. It's still thought to be the centre of somehow yeah. the centre of, of, of uh, science, the centre of uh, understanding of life. Um, and while I don't want to be rude about physics, I think it's very important. I think it's not that, you see. It's got its own work to do, not, not a different one. Okay. This uh, dissatisfaction with the state of moral philosophy at the time um, it does seem to me to relate to the positive work that you were doing in Beast and Man in, in this sense that one of the dogmas behind uh, the moral philosophy you were complaining about was the so-called naturalistic fallacy, the idea that uh, uh, any kind of uh, attempt to base ethics in a full picture of human life was bound to commit some ghastly error of moving from fact to value yes. or some such thing like that. Yes. Whereas I take it that in Beast and Man you wanted to re-establish the respectability of talking about human nature in some sense. Very much right? so. Yeah. Very much so, that's right. Yes, um, I mean, I find it hard to convey the way at that time it was habitual with a lot of very different people saying there is no such thing as human nature. Uh, this was, for one thing, um, behaviourists who wanted to say that uh, psychology is entirely about outside actions um, and the way to understand outside actions is to see how they are caused by other outside actions. The motives didn't matter um, and it, seems, it seemed to me at once and I think it seemed to all of us quite absurd because in the actual conduct of human life one's all the time got to notice motives and to try to control them. Mm -hmm. um, to, it's, it's not um, a, a fantasy, uh, an extra side issue. It's part of what, what happens I mean, is you uh, try to understand Napoleon, Napoleon uh, what he did. Uh, you will have to understand not just what he succeeded in doing, but what he was trying to do and what the vision of life he had as a whole, which mm. made that seem to be all right. Um, this seems to me uh, pretty important. And I mean, one thing that quite interested me about R. M. Howe, is he dead, by the way? Yes. Yes, good. <laughs> because I want to say something which I wouldn't say if I wasn't sure of that. Um, he had uh, lived through being a prisoner in the um, a prisoner of the Japanese. Japanese yeah. Yes, he had had a horrible time, and it appears that during that time he had been uh, working on philosophy, and then he put it all out afterwards. Now it seems to me that if you were able to do that, and it was a very impressive thing to do, the philosophy that you're working on is liable to become over simple which is what I'm saying, that prescriptivism, which I ended up with, uh, was oversimple. Um, and it was successful because it was oversimple. Mm -hmm. so you could pick up this little purple book and uh, what it asked themselves, what is morality? And by the time they'd read it, they'd know. Yes. You know it, was, it was sort of final. Yes. Um, and this is a thing that very often has, happens to people who want to put forth philosophy. Um, yes, have I? Yes. Does that sound make sense? Yes. Yes. It, it, it seems to me to relate to something that of yours that I think you only wrote very recently, um, the, where you take Michael Dummett to task yes. for saying that it's only really in the first half of the 20th century that philosophy discovered what it had always been about. The proper subject. Which, yes. the, the proper subject being yes. the study of language, or yes. the logical structure yes. of language and so on. Yes. And you go back, I think, or see yourselves going back 
to an older tradition, which is that philosophy's proper subject is uh, a reflection on human life. Yes, I mean, it's what Socrates said, that an unexamined life is unlivable to man. Yes. Yeah, well, that seems to me to be my last share of the poem. Yes. yes. And, and that fits in with the, the program of Beast and Man, which is, uh, I suppose, saying that we, in, in order to understand ourselves, we can't uh, narrow thing, c c carry on this, the analytic process of narrowing things down mm -hmm. and hiving things off, but that we have to make connections. Yes. Um, if you try to look at life as a whole, or even at your own life, You've got to look an awful lot of diff diff different directions. You've got to um, get a panorama, haven't you? Um, and this habit which was going on in the Oxford discussions of finding one particular word and saying, oh, it's much more uh, 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 doubtful than you thought. Uh, there are ambiguities beyond ambiguities. Really, I think that might sometime be needed, but mostly you shouldn't be doing that. Yes. Can can we um, do a little bit of sort of examining our consciences for a moment? Yes. Um, uh, philosophy has been, many people think, through a rather bad time over the last couple of decades. Departments have been closed. Uh, the reputation of philosophy in universities is not sky high. To put it mildly, um, why do you think that there's this uh, scepticism about the value of philosophy? Well, I feel that a lot of this is due to something badly wrong with the age that people are asking themselves: Is a profit to be made about it this year? You know, is, is the money coming out of this? Mm. Um, and of course, this is seldom true. Uh, philosophy. Um, but I mean, on top of that, when it has been petty and uh, detailed like this, people don't see the point of it. Mm -hmm. um, even if they might be prepared to uh, put in an extra thousand or two, uh, they don't want to do so if they can. If it's off-putting, I, mean, uh, I, I really feel ignorant about the way things have been going in the world because I've been rather out of the world for some time. Um, but the way in which a subject prospers is partly that students are willing to do it. Now, in fact, I think students are still really willing and anxious to do philosophy. They come in, or don't they? Uh, because they feel puzzled and they don't know what, what, which way to go, so to speak. Um, but the sort of philosophy that's going on has to be the kind that people can see the point of. Is that American called Sandel? Yes, yeah, Sandel, yeah. Yes, well, I think he's smashing. I yeah. heard him when he came here, um, and he seemed extremely good at putting out questions which everybody was interested in, hearing what the audience said and then remembering their names afterwards. Yes, I it's a very good trick. Yes. A very good trick. Yeah, but I mean that you take the trouble to do that. Oh, trick, yes. Is, yeah, this yes. is relevant to what you say. Yeah. Yeah. Why do I bother to make jokes? Mm. Uh, well, I think it's, things are much better remembered. Uh, if these, I'm sure it's Sandals, subject pupils, students. Uh, remember everything he said when he's asked them what their name was. And <laughs> I don't see there's anything wrong with that. Um, it's part of general communication and um, I suppose I really ought to know more about uh, how it's worked at different times. I mean, Russell and Moore uh, were quite popular. They both wrote in a way that uh, can be understood. Sure. Um, Air was quite popular. Uh, oh dear, yes, um, language, truth, and logic was widely read. Uh, the trouble is that language, truth, and logic really says that it's not only no point in doing philosophy, you ought to be doing science. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I wanted to, to, to focus on that for a moment because I think a, a, a lot of uh, 
people working uh, uh, obviously on the science side in universities would uh, criticize philosophy or, or they perhaps fail to see what philosophy can contribute to knowledge. Yeah. They might think that it's an elegant conversation, uh, um, a superior entertainment, but what, it, what if anything do you think philosophy can contribute to knowledge? It's not a science, well, but we want to nonetheless track knowledge in some way. I mean, knowledge is uh, knowledge of anything, I suppose, uh, including the knowledge of what life is for. And uh, I suppose <laughs> moral knowledge, the, well, what the, 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 what stinks and what doesn't, you know, yes. morally. Um, the, 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 and in order to do that, you have to know a lot about uh, people's actual behaviour, don't you? Yes. So that, that you do reason from facts to values. If we ask whether a certain custom is tolerable, we need to find out how it's working and mm. what people mean by it, and, mm. um, and all sorts of further things. Um, I mean, if your definition of knowledge actually is the physical sciences, meaning in fact, say, not biology, but physics and chemistry, if that's your, what your idea of what knowledge is, well, no, uh, you aren't getting much of it uh, from philosophy. Yes. Then there's something badly wrong with you. Yes. I think you believe, Mary, that philosophy can make a major contribution to our lives, yeah. to our culture. Um, I think also that you like philosophy to be up close to life. Yes. Perhaps closer to life than, is, than a lot of philosophers would uh, um, be comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, it's not just a question, as Wittgenstein said, of seeing the world aright in some grand vision, that you want to be a bit closer to the real practicalities. Um, I, I just have in mind here, um, there's, there are some, I suppose they might be called philosophers, who engage in really a rather unregulated kind of speculation. I'm thinking of immortalism, for example. Of which? Immortalism. Oh, yes. The, the kind, and I've, I've, seen, I've heard you be quite severe about those kinds of views. Um, and I'm wondering uh, uh, on what basis you you want to be um, critical. Uh, do you think that philosophy then loses its way if it moves far from the... Well, I think those people have lost their way. Um, they are asking about um, whether human life uh, can be carried on because it's satisfactorily without death. And it seems to me there are obvious reasons very quickly to be seen why it can't, if only you get too many people. <laughs> simple mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, you, there are bad philosophy, there's bad philosophy going on, and there are bad causes um, in philosophy. Um, I suppose one could say that um, what's traditionally called Christian science of the extreme kind, whereby you say pain isn't real and death isn't real, and, right. uh, you know, this is, this is bad philosophy. They yeah. have not thought through what they're saying. Yeah. Um, particularly, they're not relating it to the hard facts around them. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you aren't trying to do that, uh, then you aren't doing what you should be doing. And the, 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 the world that you should be talking about, the life that you should be talking about, is quite ex extensive. Um, uh, the person who deliberately picks out a little selection from it and explains that, yeah. hasn't done their philosophy, they have to be right. Yes. I think this relates to a discussion we've had ourselves before about trying to choose a word uh, or a, uh, a short phrase that would act as a title for the yeah. sort of philosophy that yes. you do. Yes. Yes. And we, we've suggested but then rejected, for example, humanism. As a, uh, as a word. It, it makes sense in relation to your philosophy because uh, a beast and man, the whole idea of, of, of talking about human beings in their environment, the trouble is the word has been 
It means Pop atheism. It, in popular it lecture, then. Yes. 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 The trouble is these words have meanings already. Yes. Somebody suggested vitalism, but you can't have that because yes. it now means something that you yes. don't want to sell. Yes. I don't know. We shall have to think harder. It, naturalism is an attractive idea, but it's such a broad notion. But I, I like it in the sense that yeah. it, it, it that your emphasis is on human beings, but not in some sort of anthropocentric, yeah. narrow yeah. way, yeah. but in in relation to the human being, the human species, yes. in its physical and social environment. Yes, uh, you know, yes. It, it understood biologically and evolutionarily. Yes. That's a word. Now make it short. <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? Yes, I think we'll come on something, but it is not straightforward. No, it's it's yes. straightforward. Mm. Okay. Yes. Um, wh what would you say to a, a young person who was thinking of taking uh, philosophy as a subject at college, at university, uh, or, or even thinking of a career in philosophy? Well, I think that doing some philosophy is really an essential part of education and I wish more people got it uh, because everybody's got within them conflicts which they uh, could do a bit more about um, understanding and bringing together and um, everybody's life is always throwing up a couple of conflicts and I think philosophy is really the way of trying to deal with conflicts and you, you see if you think what's happened about um, free will I mean a lot of people talk of though um, there wasn't any free will but they are all the same they make the question they make their own choices don't they mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't apply that to themselves a bit of if you start to think about a clash like that, you are getting somewhere which is very important to get, I think. Um, what's happening at present, it really should be said, I think, is that philosophy in general, in this country particularly, is on its way um, from an orthodoxy which, uh, of lots of little verbal queries, which is uh, increasingly not satisfying people, but is still very hard to stop because the kind of people who go in for that kind of thing work very hard at it and tend to come to the top. Yes. <laughs> I think I wish to advise someone who's considering taking a philosophy course to find out something about the what's how it goes on at the particular university that they or to one one on university that they have in mind. Pick up if they can some gossip from previous students. Um, they might, for all I know, get good stuff on Twitter or some such uh, website. Uh, there are all sorts of ways of finding out, and I think they should find out how the current public is being treated. I mean, you see, there's all this, uh, this great space between um, the sort of inquiry that's really important about ideas which are already banging together in your life and which you've got to make sense of somehow, between trying to understand all that better and detailed scrobbling about the meaning of a few words. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can only advise those putting in for it to try and find out. And I think it is worth saying that most people, for most people, a mixed course philosophy and history or English or psychology or something is better than straight philosophy. Philosophy on its own gets a bit too abstract. Um, and, and it's all right later when you're a graduate student, but I used to find that there's classics going on, you see, at the same time. I used to find it very good that Questions would come up about Greek history or something, mm -hmm. and then in the philosophy, at the same time, in the philosophy, I would be thinking about the meaning of questions, mm -hmm. and the meaning of history, uh, yes. <laughs> the meaning of being Greek. Uh, you see, uh, and I think uh, on the whole, I 
I am inclined to say to people, it's surely worthwhile you're at least taking an introductory course in this thing because you really need it, you need it all your life. Mm -hmm. um, you may not go on doing just it, um, but it will fit it in with and help you with the other subjects which you're understanding. Yes. 